And we're live. Hello, everybody. I'm just getting ready. We're gonna. We're waiting for a few other folks to join. We're um, also waiting for a few other remoter students. Um, I have a few of things here. I have a few fruits that we're going to predict. We built a really simple neural net, convolutional neural net. And we're going to use, we took a couple of pictures. I'm going to show you everything, of course, in detail. But um, it predicts our own uh, based on, on our own data so we are also going to use the image net neural net or actually the um, the data where we're going to actually use the neural net created by google um so we're also going to predict objects like scissors and uh and i don't know a cup i have a a, a bowl here we're going to be predicting a bunch of things and everything that's that neural network actually is pretty cool because it's created by google using data from kind of the community. There is a year competition to, to I don't know, display the, the best possible uh, neural networks related to image processing. So um, we're going to use it. We're going to be predicting a bunch of objects. We're actually going to start a little bit uh, with uh, how image processing works, how we're going to decompose an image into an array, right? It's just going to be numbers for, for the neural network. It doesn't know it's an image. It's just going to be a bunch of numbers. So we're going to decompose an image into, into these arrays. And then we're going to be predicting, again, uh, our fruits and our objects. So uh, we're going to keep an eye on the channel, right? The, um, the Slack channel. So I'm going to use the Slack channel. I don't know if you guys have joined already, but um, I'm going to send the link. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to post the link. Where is it? Give me one second, and we're going to share the link so you guys have access to the live chat, too. There you go. So hello. There you go. And here, that's our free Slack. So of course, this YouTube chat works. But if you use the Slack channel, it's going to be a little bit easier for us. So um, nothing. We're kind of uh, ready to start. There we go. We have a free a few new folks. Uh, what else can I send here so I can send this chat? Can I, can I look for a? Apple. We could classify emojis. I have here Matthias, who is uh, actually the creator of these machine learning models. And we're always trying to come up with ideas of fun things to do. One interesting thing would be to classify different types of emojis. You know that, um, for example, Google Hangouts, Google has these creepy emojis. They are pretty awful. Uh, but Apple has their own, and Facebook has their own, and Twitter has their own. So the same emoji, right? We can write a quick neural net and and classify the expressions of them. Would be kind of fun. Um, all right, so let's get started. And for those that are just joining, 
below. We're pretty excited because we have built a couple of new interesting things. Uh, we will be showing we will be showing you how image processing works with Python, and we're gonna show you how that link between the the raw image you're taking with your camera, with your cell phone, etc., how you're gonna fit it to a machine learning model. So we're gonna use a couple of different machine learning models. We're gonna use a really simple one, which has a great use case. I'm gonna show it in a second where we'll be extracting dominant colors out of pictures. But that's gonna be just the, the kind of the simplest unsupervised machine learning model that exists, that is the k-means model. It's a really simple uh, machine learning model. And it's gonna, again, help us extract colors. That's gonna be the first step. The second step, will be to start working with video, right? So I'm gonna be using video in this same laptop and we will be classifying objects live, okay? So I will be, for example, uh, taking an, an apple, right? And getting it close to my camera and it will be classifying it, you know, it will try, we'll see if it works, uh, classifying different fruits and also um, classifying different objects, right? If, if it works, supposedly to say scissors here or pen here, etc. We're gonna see how it goes. This is live, so something might break. Sorry if it, that happens, um, but again, it's it's gonna be be fun because we will try to do everything live. So uh, give me one second. We're gonna get started. I need to see how I'm gonna share the screen with these. All right, so first things first, this code is all live and open source. So um, in our Slack, you guys will find the code for that. It's already posted. And the idea is that we will be walking you through these notebooks. You will be able to reproduce them. You will be able to train them with your own objects. Okay, so for example, the fruit examples, I've trained them right here, right, with this background and all that. So if you try classifying images later tomorrow, you know, in your own home, maybe it doesn't work because I have just trained it with like 10 different pictures. Um, but you can reproduce it. You can create your own images. You can, instead of using fruits, you can use other types of objects. You can add more classes. In this case, we've decided only to show four different classes. Uh, you can add more if you want because it's, again, it's just a demonstration. So you will be able to reproduce all this code. Um, but of course, we're gonna do a good walk through these, these steps. So let me actually get started. I'm gonna share my screen. Hello, Tom. And Caleb, how are you guys? There you go. Caleb, Tom, you guys will be able to help me if you see that something is going wrong. Um, so our first step will be understanding how images are represented digitally and how we can pull that information, how we can manipulate that information using Python. I don't know the background of all of you in terms of programming, but uh, you don't need to know a lot about Python to understand these concepts. We're trying to keep them as simple as possible, but also we we'll try to keep them um, in, a, in a way that you can use it. Okay, you will be able to apply the same knowledge. In Python, there are a couple of really important libraries for data science in general. One of them is NumPy, which is uh, an, an array processing library. It will let you process arrays in a really efficient manner. Okay, so we're gonna use this NumPy library along with matplotlib that what it does is just help us plot things in these Jupyter notebooks that we're using. I don't know if, if I don't know if you guys have these Jupyter notebooks running locally, all right? That might be a little bit hard to, to get going. We're gonna actually release a guide on how to set up these notebooks locally in a couple of days. So hopefully you're gonna be benefited of, of, out of these. And, and at some point we wanna release these also as a service. So if that works, 
it might be good too. We will also use this OpenCV library that it's actually a C library. I think it's C slash C++. It has a, a bunch of, of code from C and C++. But there are bindings for Python. And this is a way more advanced library only intended for computer vision. Right? So it, it will let you manipulate your camera. It has algorithms already built in, optimizations algorithms. It's simple to parse images, to resize them, to, I don't know, convert them to grayscale, to change the channels of their colors. There, you, you guys can do a ton of things. And actually, to be honest, we personally, we feel like we're always scratching the surface with these libraries. There are so many things that you can do. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's really simple to get started. So to get started, in this case, what we have is how is a color represented, all right? Or what is color? Actually, color is, a, is a, of course, a complicated physical concept. But in digitally speaking, color in an image is going to be by a combination of three primary, we could say. They're not primary, but three main colors in this RGB model. There will be different models, right? Different standards to represent colors uh, digitally. Different platforms might use different ones. Kind of a, a, a ubiquitous standard today is using the RGB one. So color is just a combination of three different variables. Pretty much all the colors you can see in your screen are a combination, again, of the uh, a combination of red, green, and blue. Okay, And combining the intensity and the light of each one of these colors, you can, of course, Access, I don't know, we have uh, the count there, uh, but of like 255, uh, a really large set of numbers. There are different, um, there are other color modes. There are also, for example, we have also alpha channel, and there are a few things that are a little bit more complicated, but just to get started, again, if you think about color as a combination of red, green, and blue, right, it's enough to get us started. So here, for example, what you will be saying is any color, so you have, I don't know, think about your favorite color. It can be expressed as a combination, again, of red, green, and blue. And in this case, I'm just showing you how, for example, looks the red color. It just has um, the, oh, this is, this is bad. Actually, it should be 255 here and 0 here. And also blue is bad, but you guys get there, the idea. So, Again, from 0 to 255, you have to define the intensity of each one of the components of your final color. The in this case, we have that red is 255. It's the maximum possible value, again, from 0 to 255. Green is 0, and B is 0. And actually, if you guys look at the source code of this notebook, what you will see is just simple HTML slash CSS that you can actually tune, tune sorry, to uh, change the color you're using. So for example, let's see what happens if I add, I don't know, 120 here and 38. I'm just making it up. We're going to see kind of an orange color because it has a ton of, uh, it, it has a ton of red, has a little bit of green, and it has some blue. So the final result is, again, this orange that we have right here. So again, many, many colors, not all of them. Many colors, the ones we see that we get, we kind of, can see with our human eyes can be represented with this combination of 0 to 255 of red, green, and blue. Right? So here we're showing you, sorry, a couple of examples. In this case, we have 255 00 gives you this red color. 0 0 gives you the green color because the, the green channel, we can say the green component is at the top. It's at the maximum value, and both red and blue are 0. And finally, blue in this case is also at the at the maximum. So that's why we have a blue here. And just again to try it out, I draw gray here. You guys can again change this thing. We can change, we can add a little bit more green and we can add a little bit more uh, blue. And we're gonna drop the red channel. We're gonna see. Oh, there you go. There's another color we get. And actually, this two green, so we can change it. And again, you can generate a bunch of colors just by the combination of these three components. And this is going to be kind of the objective or the way to generate more colors, right? You are tuning these three knobs, right, you have, and you will be creating different colors. If you move uh, to the 
if you increase the number of red and you increase the number of blue, you get to this point, right? If you increase the number of green, you get to this point. So it's again like this cube that you're creating for each color by tuning those knobs. What is an image now? An image, it's just, and you probably know it, um, if you've ever seen a pixelated picture on the internet, you know, you say it needs more JPEG, right? Classical meme. It's a, an image, it's just a bunch of different pixels that represent colors, okay? So even the, the camera with the highest quality ever, it's gonna be just a bunch of pixels, pixels, sorry. It's a digital image. It's gonna be a bunch of pixels representing color in each one of them. So in this case, this image, right, right here, it has white, it has a kind of brown or a dark yellow, it has white here, it has a, a, a lighted yellow right here. So by combining these colors, we get the final values represented in this, in this image. So how are you gonna represent these images using Python? We're just gonna represent them as a matrix, as a matrix of X pixels high by Y pixels wide, or actually the opposite, right? X pixels wide and X, and X pixels wide and Y pixels high, right? That's gonna be our image. And each one of those points, it's gonna be a color pixel. But as we saw, each one of these color pixels is represented by three values. So these pixels that I have right here, right here, for example, the, the first uh, pixel of the, of the um, blue drop, it's gonna be the pixel in position, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, I don't know, six, seven, 10, 12, right? It's gonna be five, 12, and that pixel by itself has three different colors. So we're gonna use kind of a matrix. This, uh, if you guys are getting started with programming, it might be challenging, is how you represent the um, kind of matrices or nested lists with, within Python. But in this case, you can think that you have um, a matrix, right? Let me just show it to you. There you go. It's a simple image that it has two pixels by two pixels. That's it. And each one of these, of course, is a pixel. And actually, if I show you the colors, there you go. So this is when you turn these 2D image, it's just two dimensions into kind of a 3D image, right? Because you have each pixel, right? Has, each pixel is by itself, it's not a, a flat structure, it's by itself, it's another vector, right? So that's when you have, in this case, two rows by two columns, right here, two columns, but itself, each one of these columns is represented as another vector, okay? so. From the simplest image, that it's this one probably, right? Just a two by two image to something like a full HD, the get, I don't know, what's the best mobile phone out there? The one that is, um, the one that is taking the best possible pictures in the market today. That it's gonna be like 12 megapixels or 24 megapixels. I don't know too much about it. That's gonna be just again a combination of uh, these same principles. It's gonna be a matrix with colors represented inside. So you guys can try with these notebooks later. We're generating here random colors. I can generate uh, a matrix that it's a little bit um, bigger, right, in that case. So we have 10 pixels by 10 pixels. And again, the largest image that you can think of, like, I don't know, full HD, for example, or 4K, it's gonna be just this thing with a ton more pixels, but it's basically this thing. So what we will be doing now is start working with this OpenCV library. And I'm gonna show you a couple of things we can do. The first thing is that we're gonna use an image here that I actually have it, where is it? You guys can see my file browser, right? This one, can you see Chewy here? Yes? Okay, I can I can hear anybody, but uh, it's fine. Um, this one, right, it's going to be red. I just read the Chuaka image and it was read as a simple NumPy array. And actually, it's a NumPy array of, and I can show you guys here the 
information of this. Well, in this case, it's a little bit larger. I think we're, uh, oh no, it's fine. 700 pixels by 393 uh, and three dimensions because these is gonna be the color. This is gonna be the interesting thing. Each pixel is represented by, again, three different components. And now I can show you this image, the one that I have just imported. But what you will see right here, and different from this image that I had, is that it's kind of inverted, right? And it's actually because by default, the OpenCV library, it's not using the RGB model. Remember, RGB, red, green, blue. It's actually using the BGR, which is blue, green, red. Right, so it's a, a different model. It's by default, it's importing a different model. It's pretty simple to change that, of course. In that case, you just need to turn your image. You can you can transform the color and you can say BGR to RGB, period. You show the image and, and it's done. If you need other types of transformations, and these might be at some point common, depending on the machine learning task you need and the pre-processing of the images that you need. Sometimes with machine learning, color is not that important. So you can kind of get rid of those components. It, it depends. In this case, you turn it into a grayscale. It's extremely simple. Resizing it, it's also going to be simple. I'm just going to show the examples as, as quickly as possible because I want to get into the first machine learning model. In this case, the resizing was kind of um, fixed, right? It wasn't dynamic the image is 700 pixels by 300 pixels or 350 or something and i just resized it to a different proportion right i'm not keeping the same aspect ratio i'm just you know hard coding 300 by 300 and of course that the image is is i don't know now it's the form right it's not that's not holding the same aspect ratio as before so when you're rescaling or resizing images it's important Sometimes it's important to keep that aspect ratio. For colors or, or simple objects, not that important. But if you are basing your machine learning model in the shape of something, for example, the shape of a face, then it's going to be important to keep the a good aspect ratio or actually to keep the aspect ratio of your image. OK? Cropping is also pretty simple. What you will try to do is kind of find the center of the image and crop from there, pretty much. And finally, we're showing you a little bit extra detail. This is not going to be a really useful for machine learning, but so you can see how, how simple it is to work with the open CV library. And now we're going to get to the actual, to actually to the first machine learning model of the night, which is the uh, color detection model, All right? So we're going to take an image and we're going to detect the most uh, the dominant color we say we're going to try to find extract uh, five colors out of the image so to get started i'm going to load the scikit learn library that's a really good library for machine learning especially for um, education so when you're just getting started the scikit learn library rocks and we are going to use the k means algorithm it's a non supervised machine learning algorithm I don't know if you have this background, but in machine learning, you have supervised, you have unsupervised, and you have something in between that it's reinforced, reinforcement learning. In this case, k-means is unsupervised, OK? And what k-means is going to do is you're going to give it a bunch of data, and it will try identifying groups by itself without you expressing anything about that data. The best possible example is a recommendation system. So for example, Netflix or Spotify. Netflix or Spotify, for example, has, of course, has a million users, more than a million, but has a ton of users. And what it wants to do is kind of group those users by similar interests, right? Whatever, what, for, uh, trying to find matches in terms of what the user likes so they can recommend things to each other. The way it's going to do that, it, it's like, it's not going to, Spotify is not going to analyze each user manually. Let's going to say, I don't know, this person likes this artist, and we're going to put it in this table, the rock table. And this other person likes blues, so we're going to put him in the blues uh, bucket. 
because that will require a ton of human work. You have to see the artists that they like, and you have to classify those user, users manually, saying this person is listening to BB King all day. We're gonna put it in the blue in the blues bucket, and these guys are listening to Led Zeppelin all day, so we're gonna put it in the rock bucket. Right? That's gonna take a lot of manual work. So the unsupervised learning mechanism, what it's gonna do is you're gonna just throw the users to the model and the model is gonna figure out dif uh, different groups out of that data. So it might, for example, it's gonna group me and someone else in the same group. And it's, gonna, it's not gonna make any judgment. It's not gonna say, I group these guys because these two guys like blues. No, it's just gonna say, hey, these two users are really similar. They're in the same cluster, that's it. You can, of course, then do a little bit of analysis and say, okay, let's actually see what these users have in common. But the unsupervised learning method is gonna work by itself. It's gonna, just gonna find those groups by itself. So let's get started here. I'm uploading uh, scikit-learn. I have a utility function that it's the RGB to hexadecimal. As you guys know, you can represent RGB to X. If you've ever worked with CSS of HTML, you know it already. And we're actually gonna, we're gonna define this machine learning model, which is extremely simple. The first thing we're gonna do is load the image. With that image, we're gonna, as usual, transform, remember that OpenCV is loading it as BGR, we're gonna turn it into RGB. From then, we're gonna resize it, and this is a really important step. Remember that a picture or an image was this matrix of X pixels wide by Y pixels high times three for each one of the pixels colors. So if you guys don't resize your images when working with your machine learning models, it's gonna take a lot of time to train, all right? You, if you have a ton of processing power, you might decide not to resize them. That's great because you are not losing any sort of information. But in this case, we are actually resizing them. Once we've resized and pretty much everything right here, everything here is done, what I'm gonna do is create a k-means mm, scikit-learn model. And this is pretty fun because out of these, let me just show it to you, I'm gonna run it again. We have the, the images kind of preloaded, right? So you guys can uh, load these notebooks and, and run the examples. It might find different results, by the way. Let's see if it does. So, so if you keep, keep an eye on one of these colors, it's going to find a different result. Well, in this case, it didn't. Uh, there you go. So it has a different result because the clusters are created or they are initialized randomly. Okay, so you might find, you, you will actually find different, probably you will find different results. So the machine learning model, the one that it's extracting the colors out of the, this picture is pretty simple and it's only these two lines right here, creating the model and putting, putting the, um, and fitting and predicting kind of, it's kind of a com combined method. And in our, in our machine learning classes, actually we have a, a notebook in which we run our students through a bunch of machine learning methods and they are all as simple as you see right here. It's creating the model, with a given parameter, it's important to define how many, in this case, clusters we want, and then you're fitting it. When you fit it, you create the labels, you kind of extract those labels, and then we find, we show, sorry, this pie chart right here. So here, what I could do is tune the K parameter. So instead of finding six different clusters, I might want to find, for example, three, and see what it has. There you go, so these three are the clusters that it found. And here we can try k equals three two. There you go. So this was the first machine learning model applied to images, and as you guys see, it's extremely simple. The machine learning model. Sorry if I'm disappointing someone. Just two lines, literally, and you have it working. This is actually. Sorry, I have someone with a little bit of background noise. Ryan, can you mute your mic? Thank you. Uh, you can, of course, unmute it if you have any questions. Uh, Ryan, Tom, can you guys keep an eye on if you see questions, just in case? And let me know if, it if there are. So, um, guys, as I was saying, 
the machine learning model is extremely simple. The power, the, the magic happens, especially in the image processing part. Okay, reading the image, transforming it, resizing it, etc. Okay, everything else is fairly simple. We actually came up with this model by working with a friend company. They needed to classify clothes based on color, right? So when you are shopping, right? You can you can actually you can let your users filter something like greens or reds or I want a blue shirt, right? You could manually tag each piece of clothing manually, or you can train a simple machine learning model. It's going to work for you. Um, so we are now going to use the OpenCV camera. Um, here, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. There you go. There you go. So the I want to go as quickly as possible. Actually, you know what, guys? I'm going to skip over this. You can see it later. Here, you actually have a couple of examples. I don't want to waste your time with this because this is more open CV. Where I want I want to just go to the machine learning model and show it to you in action because that's a lot of fun. But basically, this open CV model actually I could run it. Uh, let me see if yeah, no need. What's gonna do? It's gonna spin a new component in your machine that is gonna turn your webcam and it will let you capture a video out of it. You are, we're actually selecting the camera right here. If you have more cameras, you can change this integer to select other ones. And in this case, it's gonna let you capture video out of your camera. It's also going to let you, for example, crop and resize images all live, kind of, um, as you are having the panel or the component exposed. All right. So just look it up by yourselves. It's just a quick tutorial how to use OpenCV. We're going to jump directly to something a little bit more interesting, OK? Because again, it's. So, um, well, this is pretty much the same thing. More camera, more camera. Again, now that we've, we've created this for you, it's going to be a lot easier. OK? So this is usually, it does require a little bit of work to get it running. So you can use this notebook, the number four, to generate objects uh, or, or, sorry, um, photographs or pictures out of your objects on your own. So we're going to skip directly we're going to skip directly to our first deep neural network of the night that it's going to take me how much time do you guys think actually i'm going to tell you what it does and, and i think i can just spin it yes this thing is working so i'm gonna get this thing running let me see when it starts thing there you go. There you go. So this is the open CV camera. Can you guys see this? Yep. yep. Thank you. So I, I it seems like I'm a chihuahua. I don't know how, how fast you guys can get the the um, the updates of the camera, but I'm gonna start approaching with objects and we're gonna see what it says okay so i'm gonna approach with the scissors with a pair of scissors i haven't tried scissors so i don't know if it has it actually trained uh, let's see not working letter opener no it probably doesn't have a scissor let's try with a ballpoint or with a pen let's see if it has it phone and pens ballpoint Phone and pen. There you go. Phone and pen. It's pretty good. I mean, the models are, of course, are not perfect, especially with the, the, the way I'm running them. But uh, it works. Let's see if I have here, I don't know, the remote of our AC. Let's say what it says. I don't know if it has a remote. Remote control. There you go. Can you guys see it? Remote control. Pretty cool, right? Just. It's, it's giving us the, the probability of, of having that object. In that, in that case, 
given the resizing that we're doing of images to have this workshop running live and to be simple, the probabilities, as you can see, are pretty low. But again, the, the, the class with the highest probability is the correct one. It's a remote control. Uh, let's see my water. Let's see what it says about my, my water bottle. Water bottle, there you go. See, 76% water bottle, it's working. So what about my phone? I'm just getting excited about it. I'm gonna spend the whole night looking at pictures, to be honest. There you go, iPod, cellular phone, perfume. Um, see, it, has, it actually has iPod classes, pretty fun. So again, I could keep trying on objects. Let's see a cup. I haven't tried this one. Pitcher, coffee mug, yes. There you go. So as you can see, this thing is working. By the way, when you run this um, camera, look at the comments we provided. So for example, to quit the camera, you just need to press the Q. That's it. It's gonna quit. So how is this thing going to work now that you guys saw it in action? This model or this machine learning model is actually, we're gonna look for ImageNet right here, is a neural network, a deep neural network that was trained by Google. You guys can Google Inception V3. It's a neural network that is already created by Google, and it's pre-trained with the ImageNet data set. And what is ImageNet? It's a huge data set of images that it's part of a year competition. You know, in this case, it has four, 14 million different images. And I think these are the, no, I don't know where are the classes. I think there are 1,000 different classes. So one, once per year, the best colleges out there, the best, I don't know, research groups, they get together to beat the ImageNet challenge. And the idea is to get, is who is getting the best possible accuracy score at predicting images. So it, this happens once per year. And most of these groups, when they are, once they are done with the competition, they are releasing their models as open source models. And in this case, we can just import it with a regular, with a simple Python import. So in this case, what I'm doing is, I'm doing from Keras application import Inception V3. Keras has these, I should have linked you guys to the documentation here. Keras is, I'm sorry, I'm always skipping kind of the introductions. I don't want to bore you with the, the, the details. Keras is a really simple API or library on top of TensorFlow and a few other, actually, libraries. And what Keras does is it gives you a really simple interface to manage, um, to create neural networks. And it has already some models already created. So all these ones are already created. And these are usually from that ImageNet competition, some of them at least. Um, Inception v3 is the one we're currently using, right? And you can tune the arguments, you can change the weights. So there are different actually weights um, or, or kind of pre-trained weights that you can get. Another pretty common one is this BGG16 that it was also from uh, an ImageNet competition. It was also released as open source. I think MobileNet too. MobileNet is a really um, popular one because it's supposedly to be low power. I haven't tried it by myself, but it's low power. So it's one model you can um, fit and you can use in a mobile phone, for example. So you can use a machine learning model in, in your phone and it's supposedly going to run better. So all these are already pre-trained not just pre-trained, but pre-created neural networks by itself. So, so the, the whole model, the layers, the pooling, the dense layers, the, the everything is already done and it's already configured and it's created for these neural networks. So you can do just from Keras import application, application support Inception v3, and as you can do Inception v3, you can import VGG16 or MobileNet or any other one and get it going with these weights. And you have it, again, as we've seen, um, 
classifying and protecting images live. Okay, so in this case, I am pulling a cell phone image. This one was taken here in this office, and it's actually Matthias phone. And as you can see, it has a pretty good accuracy score for cellular phone. Let's see what we have. What else we have here? Chewy. No, Chewy, it's not going to recognize you. This one, we're going to try the birds. I probably need to resize it. I'm going to use data slash one.jpg. There you go. It's working. Let's see what it says. Uh, it's one. Yeah. There you go. Be eater in the unpacking. All right. It's, 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 it's doing its best, right? So these images are not probably the best possible ones. Again, we're using the models already. We're using not just the model created by these guys, we're also using the weights that they were trained with for these type of objects. So here in this image net library, you have a limited set of 1,000 different objects. So if, I don't know, if, um, as I was using scissors today, if there are no scissors in these, um, in these data set, it's impossible for it to recognize it, to be honest. Any questions? Can you guys see any questions out there? Anything we should um, stop and take a look at? Actually, I can see right here. Oh, there we go. We're good. We're going to do. We're doing good. All right. So now we're actually going to the strong point of the night, which is our own neural network. Okay, we have created this model. We have trained this model with our own pictures. All right. And we're going to make it classify and predict things live. Okay. So again, this is all homebrew. All right. This is all homebrew. So um, a few things. This model, let's actually get started with these things right here. I will not re execute this notebook because it actually will do it. We have time. Yeah, you guys will see the model being trained live. Okay. So, what we're going to do with these simple model is we will be loading the camera and taking pictures of things that we wanted to classify. So, when you load this same notebook, I'm going to run the camera. Okay. And where, where is the execution of it? There you go. And what you guys will do is up, get close with your objects, and you're going to start pressing the keys, the key uh, in your keyboard, the number one, the number two, the number three, the number four, right? We're actually uh, capturing those events here, one, two, three, four. And it's going to save it as different types of images or different classes. Oh, sorry. There you go. So you're going to save these four classes. Again, we created four because it was demonstration purposes. You guys can create more if you want. So it's going to create these four different classes. And it's going to store them all in your local directory. So right here in data, I have, for example, image type 1. Here, what we defined was banana was 1, red apple was 2, pear was 3, and green apple is 4. So um, here. I have my banana pictures, right? Uh, like uh, I, I, I try to move it uh, forward and backward and spin it a little bit. So trying to different shapes, or, or because this is going to be the data that's going to be used for the machine learning model, right? For the neural net. So more pictures right here of an apple, and as you can see, the pictures are not perfect. They're kind of pixelated. My hand is there. Sometimes my shoulder is there. So it's not perfect. It's going to work. And again, it's going to keep here, here. So it's going to, again, keep different pictures in different directories. And what we're going to do is we're going to load those images right here from those directories. In this case, what we're using is a pr the pre-processing model of Keras. OK, so Keras, that machine learning framework that I showed you before, it also includes a couple of utility libra libraries, sorry. 
In this case, it is the pre-processing module that's going to load images from, um, from uh, the, the directory you're specifying. And we're also turning them into arrays. As you guys remember, so let me show you the bananas right here. There you go. Uh, so um, uh, enumerate type uh, one at zero. This is my first banana picture. So this one, image type one, this one, it's actually this array that you guys can see in the background. 160, 150, uh, 54, 151, right? That's probably this gray point at the top, you know? So that's probably that, uh, that point. So again, it's loading all the images and it's turning them into these arrays that we showed in the first notebook when we were explaining how images were composed digitally. So here we have type two apples and pear is type three and a green apple is the type four. So we're loading these images, all right? So step one was creating the images and saving them locally. We are then loading them, we're reading the images here. And just as a quick recap, we have 25 images here. We have 26 here. I know it seems like we have more uh, red apples than anything else. And we are, so here it's it's a little bit of um, kind of uh, creating different classes. And, and here we need to create the categorical types. There you go. That's more a utility step that we need than something useful. And this is going to be our machine learning model. So we're using Keras. And here I'm going to increase the size of my notebook so you guys can see it with a little bit more detail. We are creating a sequential Keras model. There is also a kind of a functional model. The, the sequential one is the most common one. And then we're starting to add our layers. OK, so I don't know if you know what a convolutional net neural network is. It's not something we're going to explain in just one workshop. It's a little bit more advanced. But it's just a bunch of images, one after the other. And actually, we're going to share a few resources with you, so a few blog posts and free uh, resources you, can, you guys can use to understand how a convolutional net neural net is created. But basically, it's going to be these, this stack of different layers that it's processing that array of images. And it's going to finally predict the um, the final class of your images. So here we have uh, the input, right? Has the width of the image, the height, the height of the image, and the three different colors we have. And the output is four different classes. It can be type one, banana, type two, red apple, type three, pear, type four, green apple, I think. That's going to be the four different types we have. So we are creating the neural net model. Right, This is the function. This is a model. And the summary here is telling you all the, again, the layers that it has. It has a convolutional layer. It's having a uh, pooling layer, dropout layers, a convolutional layer, another pooling one. So it's, this is the model. And sorry, this should be here. What we're going to do now is fit the model. The model is going to be fit with the array of images that were previously scaled, right? Something that I didn't show you in detail was those uh, one was one of those steps we had at the top. So we were scaling the the images. It's going to work better if we use a scaling processing mechanism. And the Y character is the type of the image. So for example, the first image, this one, was a banana. So here it can be out of four possible classes, it's going to be banana is going to be one. Everything else is going to be a zero. This is usually called a dummy variable. I don't know, Tom, if you are still there. We talked about this yesterday. So this is a dummy type of variable. So this is banana is one, apple and pear, these are all zeros. Right? If you scroll down, here we have 
are red apple. So red apple is in one, everything else is a zero. So we're going to, again, feed our machine learning model the input, the array, and the different classes. And here we're training different epochs. Actually, I want to turn this thing into something smaller. smaller. 20. And now the machine learning model is starting to get trained. Depending on the computer that you have, depending on the number of images that you've chosen, depending on the scaling or the resizing you've done in your, to your images, it might take a little bit more time or a little bit less time. Here we see that the accuracy is improving, and we see the loss, the error, that it's decreasing. Okay, So ideally, accuracy is increasing over time, and the loss is decreasing. Okay, So here we're getting approaching 76%, 87%, pretty nice, 98%, pretty nice. All right, so we're probably overfitting this model, doesn't matter. 98%, 1, 95, 96, there you go. So these are machine learning model being trained live. Okay, the loss is also being redu is reduced a ton. There you go. And out of, out of all these iterations, we had 20 iterations, our machine learning model has a 0.99 accuracy with a 0 0.013 loss, okay? This is the error of the model. That's it. So actually, this is something you shouldn't do. We're gonna do it anyways, for simplicity. But in this case, we're gonna try predicting the class of one of these images. I'm gonna actually take the image number, uh, let's see, number five, for example, this one. It's actually, let's use one, one that looks a little bit better. This one, number two first, and then we're going to use number five. So I'm going to try classifying, I'm going to try predicting the class of an image, but with the same data that I, that I used for the training process. That's not good. That's something we shouldn't do. But again, for simplicity, I'm just going to head, go ahead and do it. And let's see what it says. We have completely retrained this process. So this could break right here, this is live. There we go. It predicted a banana. It was, again, from our model. Let's see what happens with the image number five. There you go. It also predicted a banana. Um, actually, I can show you guys what a prediction looks like. A prediction is actually uh, an array of the four different classes with probabilities Okay, for each one of those classes. In this case, the model is, again, simple, simple and it's kind of overfitted. So it's giving us a perfect accuracy for the banana type. In a more realistic machine learning model, it's going to tell you something like 0.89% probability of this thing being in a banana, 0 0.05 being an apple, you know, stuff like that. And actually, I could try with the, oh, what is it, data1.jpg. Let's see if. Oh, I need a target size. Oh, it's good. There you go. So it's predicting that it's a pair. I don't know why. Probably of the color. And it's, again, a little bit of overfit. So it's not, it's not working so fine. But again, the idea is that it's going to give you a probability of each one of these things being of a different class. So let's try with something different. In this case, we're going to try with an apple. Let's use a different one. I'm going to use, uh, for example, for type. Uh, two, we're going to use the first apple. It has a little bit of my shoulder there. So it's going to be the picture at number zero. Red apple. Nice. We're going to use uh, some other one. Uh, this one that is deeper. Number eight. Let's see what it says. Also red apple. Again, we are using the same pictures that we used for. We're using. We're trying to predict or classify an image with the same image that we used for the training process. It's not ideal, right? But again, it's just a demonstration. So now it's a moment of truth. I will turn the camera on. We're going to see what this thing says. All right, so this can break, by the way. Sorry if it does.
There you go. So that's my camera right there. Camera, camera. And it has, I don't know why, it's changing. It, the, the background noise probably affecting it. But let's approach an object here. Red Apple, 100%. Live, Red Apple. There you go. Well, sorry, I, I get too excited. Um, Red Apple, there you go. It's live. What else? Uh, we're going to put a pair. Let's see what it says with a pair. Not working. A pair needs to be closed, seems. And it's confusing it. So that then, in that case, it's working perfectly. But when I go a little bit deep, it is confusing it with a green apple. So it seems like the shape, when the object is so far away, wasn't taken so accurately. And as we can see, a red apple, a uh, green apple, sorry, it's pretty similar. So the machine learning model is having a little bit more trouble defining it. In this case, actually, it's confusing it with a pair. So as you can see, the model is not perfect. Uh, let's see a complicated one, a tough one. What is this thing? Model? What is this thing, model? It's a banana. Nice. Perfect. Are you sure it's a banana model? No, it's a red apple. Nice. So that's our machine learning model that, again, is working live with our fruits. Pear, red apple, green apple. So again, in this case, I'm cheating. I am the one cheating. If I approaching it, I, I, it's, it's like it, it took kind of a, uh, the wrong um, pattern. What does it say with this red ball? It's an apple? That's what you think? No, you're hungry, machine learning model. You're hungry. It's not an apple. It's a ball. All right. So again, where am I? So my head looks like a pear. There you go. At least I'm not a, a dog, as it said before. So that is, again, the model working live. We've, guys, we've trained this model live. We didn't have this plan. I was actually going to use something different that it's loading the pre-trained model, right? So something you guys can do here, once you're done, is when you have your model, you can, for example, save your weights, right? You can save your weights, dump all the layered weights on a, on a condensed file. This is a file explicitly used for um, numeric storage. Or you can save, in this case, you're saving all, only the weights, the model, with our the model, the layers, they are not saved. You have to reconstruct this thing. Or you can actually save the whole thing. In this case, we can save the whole thing. So model.save, it's going to save the model with the model architecture, all the layers, and all the model weights, plus the state of the optimizer, right? Um, if you want to keep training it later, so this is pretty fun. Okay, you can train, save, train, save, train, save, right, and 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 make the training process in different stages, right, or steps. So once you save your model, and my model right here is stored locally, it's right here, fruit CNN model. In this case, I have the weights also in case we need to create it. Once you have the model, you can actually import it. A low model with that H5, the summary, it's pulled. So this is a different notebook, OK? This is pulled from my hard drive, just pulling the model. And you can spin, well, in this case, I have to do import. I, I'm missing a bunch of imports here, probably. And time, and it's working. No, NP. Import compile as MP. There you go. We're starting the notebook. There you go. So hopefully we're not missing any more imports. My bad. I I changed this thing. There you go. Seems like it's going to work now. There you go. 
So the model just loaded more bananas for the model. Banana, banana, banana. It's actually not doing so well. There you go. Banana. I need to get away. Banana, 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 banana. There you go. So the model again is is working. And what I've done is I killed the process. What I've done is just imported the model from the H5 file. So you guys can train this thing in a supercomputer and you can then move this thing to a much mundane, you know, regular computer and do predictions with the model already trained. Okay, you can save these, you can store, you can train it in a, in a testing environment, you can move it to production later. This is the beauty of these models that again can be saved. You can do the same thing with the scikit-learn model, by the way. Um, we didn't show it just because it, it's not necessary. All right, so questions, I have the chat right here. Um, if the models were laying more on the colors and the shape of the infer, not so much. It's a really good question. So what you guys will learn when you get into the um, convolutional neural net world is that actually there is a big difference between of the dif uh, based on the different layers that a neural net mod um, model has. Usually the first couple of neural uh, layers are used for what we call as feature extraction, okay? So then is when the model is gonna be kind of, first of all, the pre-processing of your pictures is really important. So you might have a model that relies on grayscale images, all right? So that's gonna be a little bit more interesting in terms of um, shape, for example, because we're actually uh, getting rid of the colors. So that's step one. Second one is again, all these, first couple of layers that you can actually look at the mobile net uh, model. Where do we have Inception V3? We don't have mobile net, we have Inception V3. So this kernel was working. So uh, model that summary, there you go. Let me decrease the size. So these are all the layers that this model has, a ton. This is the neural net created by Google. I'm still crawling. I don't know if you guys get the update, but this is a crazy model. And what these guys are doing is, again, they have different parts of the neural net. This is why it's called actually deep learning that are meant for more of the feature extraction part. So some of those layers will be extracting features and you can actually use the, those pre-trained models all right the feature extraction model for later it, it actually it has kind of the optimizer the the classical gradient descent you guys have probably seen already it's kind of pre-trained it's a it has found a, a good spot to keep resuming the training when you um feed your own layers but again answering your question directly it's usually really hard to understand how these models are working because these are deep neural nets. There is no deterministic, there is nothing deterministic behind it. It's actually starting in a random point and it's optimizing from that place. So it's really hard to understand what they are doing. Usually, if you need a little bit more color, if you need a little bit more um, shape related, or the distance to the camera of the to the object stuff like that um you will need a little bit more pro pre-processing um yes rory that's that's i haven't tried raspberry pi but it's that's completely possible once the model is trained the the predicting phase is really cheap computationally speaking. It's not really hard, or it's not really process intensive to predict something out of the train model. That's why I can literally read the model from this H5 file and it can have it predicting instantly, okay? Because the models are again, uh, those are the important parts. And you can actually, so a mobile phone, 
is not huge in terms of computation power. And you can write, you can guys run this thing also uh, on a mobile phone. Oh, and, and also, something interesting, there is also a JavaScript ver version of TensorFlow. So you can use the same weight with a JavaScript version of TensorFlow, and you can predict things live your websites. Okay, this is huge. This is pretty intense. So um, again, once the model is trained, everything else is simple. Training is expensive. So people, any other question? How was it? Um, we know that the whole thing of, um, I'm actually going to stop sharing the screen and turn my camera. There you go. So we know that the whole neural net part is a little bit uh, challenging. And it's, it's hard to understand, to be honest. I, myself, I am scratching the surface and understand the, the internals, everything, but get to the point to, for example, what Inception V3 is doing behind the scenes. It's really complicated. I mean, there is a, a lab at Google, you know, really smart PhD people working on these models. So what we want to say here is that you can get this thing going. You can use these models right now. There is not a lot to learn to, to, to kind of, it's like, don't try. Usually our students are coming to us saying, I need to know linear algebra for this thing. You don't need to. It's fine if you know, because you can get into the details, but you can get started today with real applications. You can keep moving forward you know, with your learning later without spending two years with really abstract concepts without doing any real applications out of extracting any real applications out of that knowledge. So you can get started right now. OK, you can just pull the Keras package, pull uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, please tell us. We're going to send a quick survey later. Please tell us if you have those notebooks running, if it's uh, complicated to get them running, et cetera. And again, start using it today. You have our examples. You can, you can go this uh, next family meeting. You can gather everybody, and you can say, I'm going to run a quick machine learning model. You can put, I don't know, grandma, aunt, mom, dad, and classify different family members, you know, these four different types. So uh, you guys can do it whenever you want. Just try it. That's the objective of this workshop. Give, give you resources so you can get started right now. Any more questions? Anything before wrapping it up? Ryan, Tom, what's up, guys? Hey, uh, that was awesome. awesome. Good. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you, man. You're welcome. So uh, Ryan and Tom here are the guys that can lecture us in terms of the more technical terms and details. Not at all. Um, Not at all. Yeah, you can. So see you around. And Rory, best way to follow the team, just you know, the YouTube, the Slack. We're always trying to share resources and keep you guys posted in this case. So uh, see you around. If you have any questions, again, you will have your our email. We're going to email the recording and the quick survey to understand how we can help you with in terms of the Jupyter Notebooks and the setup of all these, because we know that it's still a little bit tough to do it. And that's it. Have a great night, and thank you for joining.